If you told your friends and family you were going to quit your job to make camping videos on YouTube, what do you think they'd say? Um, you're crazy. <laughs> well, I'd call him a f***ing idiot. Doesn't know the first thing about camping. Uh, that'd be very foolish. It's a good idea. That could change your life. I think so. I don't know. I don't think you could do it. Jono, you must be tripping. Damn right I am. I just quit my job. A good job making maps in a quiet office in a small Canadian town. This concept wasn't exactly new to me. In fact, it was my third time leaving a steady job to feed the hunger of my obsession. I thought the first time I left my job for adventure might satisfy me, but it only whet my appetite. The second time I thought I could find a balance with the new small town lifestyle closer to nature. This third time was different. I wasn't escaping or finding balance. I was becoming one with the obsession. Camping was not going to be a break from life, camping was going to be my life. After putting huge hours into YouTube for 4 years, my channel had scraped and clawed its way to about 40,000 subs. That may not be many in social media terms, but it was starting to provide enough revenue to cover my modest living expenses. Combined with my savings, I knew I could give myself the green light to camp for a full year, at least as an experiment and maybe more if the channel grew. However, I feared what my partner Aaron would think of the idea. When I finally brought it up, she knew I was too rational to do something like this without a plan, so she was behind me all the way. After thinking it through for a few months, the possibility became more and more real until I found myself walking into my boss's office. I told him I'd be leaving to make camping videos on YouTube. That sounded weird to say to my friends and family, and it was almost embarrassing to tell people what I was doing. I went to business school for a steady career, and now I sounded like a dreamer, possibly a fool. But the more serious fears about what I was doing came from within. What if I got injured, or our financial situation changed? Where would this lead long term? What if turning my passion into work ruined it, or if something changed with YouTube? But passion pushed through the doubts, and days after submitting my resignation, I went out for the weekend to celebrate. For years, one particular obsession of mine has been to see a real display of the Northern Lights. Not a faint glow on the horizon, but shimmering lights overhead. There was a good forecast for them that night, so I sat beside the fire and waited for darkness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. No way. Incredible. Oh. <laughs> this means so much to me. I've, I've spent hundreds of days camping. And whenever there's a good aurora forecast, it's, it's cloudy or I can't camp. And the stars finally have aligned. There were happy tears watching the lights that night, and it felt like a sign that I made the right decision. My irritating rationality knew that it was just a coincidence, but it was still a meaningful one. There were three big things that wanted to happen in the next 12 months. One of them just got checked off my list, and my year-long experiment hadn't even begun. I'd given two months notice at work, and now I was counting down the days until I could get some proper trips in. It felt like the approach of summer vacation in grade school, but a hundred times better. In my home province of Ontario alone, there are over 250,000 lakes, and a lifetime isn't enough to see them all. So where to begin this dream? I got an invite from a friend to join him on a river that almost never gets paddled, and I told him I was in. I'd seen something interesting on satellite that was near our start point, so I decided to go in a couple days early on my own to search for it. I had high hopes for the trip at my favorite time of year, but things didn't quite go according to plan. Day one of what should be about a week long trip here. I'm actually starting solo for two days, two nights, and then I'll be meeting up with another couple of guys for the main leg of the trip. But I'm extending it a little bit, get a full long trip out of it. Hopefully really good fishing, wildlife, and the special Northern scenery. Did one 900 meter portage. Now I'm on the second one into the main lake that I'll be on for this little side mission. There's a special place I want to get to. Here we go. 
Aaron and I were actually on this lake last year, this time. It's just a gorgeous lake. It's over 10 kilometers long, dotted with islands, full of pike. You gotta love it. Beautiful little waterfall here. Couldn't resist getting out. I guess that's a good segue into why I'm doing this whole little extra side trip before the main trip. It is to see a waterfall that has captivated me for quite a while. I've seen it on satellite, almost no one would ever see it. That's what I'm shooting for. Home sweet home. Beautiful spot to camp here. Nice exposed rock, jack pine, no shortage of firewood. A neat little fire ring here with some stools. Just such an awesome spot. Makes you feel so spoiled to have it all to yourself. Should help with the flies a little. Not too bad with the wind, but they're around. Well done, sir. Well, thank you. And before I get into the hammock, it's just one more thing I need to hit maximum comfort. Catch of the day. Keeping it cool there in the water. Wind's going down, so I'm gonna get some fishing in. But the wind being down means black flies are free to do as they will. And what they will is to chew on my flesh. So beautiful here. Oh, just set the hook and pulled it out. All right, second chance. Okay, there it is. I'm not even gonna net it. Wow, really calmed down, turned into such a nice evening. We've got sun dogs around the sun now. It's funny, sometimes it takes days, four or five days to get into the flow of a trip. I kind of felt it immediately. <laughs> oh, fish on. <laughs> That's the feeling right there. And I was just thinking, social media and cell phones are a disease. This is a cure. I feel so content right now. And uh, you know, this is the easy start of the trip. It's gonna get a lot more challenging, but looking forward to that too. Looked right in the corner of the mouth. Just give me one sec. There you go, buddy. Thank you.
Wow. Just wow. I am setting an alarm for probably 5, 5.30 a.m. I want to get at her right away. Great day. Really looking forward to tomorrow, though. As a man with Irish descent, I'm able to get 100% of my daily minerals and vitamins from potatoes. So this will give me everything I need today, along with some ketchup for added sugar nutrition. Mm. Fish on. Okay. All right, buddy, thank you. So I want to cut west through the bush here and I'm just looking for the path of least resistance because it's about a kilometer over and finding that path of least resistance makes it so much easier if you do find it. Oh, rod twitched, rod twitched. And... Yeah, there it is. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, same old really. There we go. All right, here we go. <laughs> Aaron and I attempted this last year. We gave up. It's just impenetrable boreal forest. There are little gaps that you can squeeze through, but we opted to portage into the next lake instead and do some fishing there, which was probably the best choice, but still been on my mind and so here I am getting really excited moose poop I can't wait to see these falls I'm about halfway finding some decent reasonable terrain to get through better than what Aaron and I had found last year and I can see on my topo map that I'm at the height of land here and I can hear now that I'm over the hump I can hear the waterfall Moose signs all over here. And then somebody lost a good chunk of fur here. I'm really close now. The back half of this bushwhack turned into a pretty nice walk, actually. Uh, it's a nice jack pine forest, which is pretty clear. I was expecting walls of balsam fir, and I can see the falls through the trees. Oh man, so excited, and I want to fish it. I have no idea what's in there, if anything. This, this river virtually dries up in the summer. There's not much water in, in the summer at all. So, see if any fish take to it. Oh, I'm gonna get a lot steeper here to get down there. Oh man. It's like a beautiful gorge. <laughs> what a spot. Wow. What a beautiful little shoot there. I'll get the drone out so you can see it better. Beautiful. 
so happy I got to see it. I'm just trying to get to the base of the falls or as close as I can to fish it. See if anything's in here. Not a bite. Just switch it up. But I'm not getting a good vibe here. The spot like this, usually it's automatic if they're there. No bites, but 100% worth it. I want to see the top of these falls. This rock just looks old as time itself. And it almost is. What a beautiful little gorge here, right before the falls. Back to the lake, it felt a lot longer coming back than it did on the way, which is usually the case. It's actually cold out. We finished lunch, finished packing up, get out of here. Gotta go all the way back, I came yesterday to rendezvous with Rob and uh, set up our shuttle. This is a river trip, so that's the inevitable nasty part of it. Back into the access lake. Just gotta get back to the car. That's where I'll camp tonight. Stashed my gear in the bush near the access point for tomorrow. Gotta sleep in my car tonight, drive to Rob's tomorrow morning, and then we'll come back and start here again. So a bear run off here on Forester Road, middle of nowhere. Here's home for the night. Just a random, ugly clear cut. Getting everything juiced up. Just gonna sleep in there tomorrow tonight so I can get going first thing tomorrow without much pack up. I'm just killing time here. To be honest, that kind of got me excited for some top water. Holy crap. I just looked up and there's a bear right behind me. Fourth one of the day, right over there. Let's see if I can get out silently to film him. Oh, right there. There you go, there's your big boy. Seems mean, but it's in their best interest to be scared of humans. It was cool. I wonder what else come by here. I figured some would. Bears or moose, actually, I thought more likely. We'll see if we get any other visitors. That was a long night in the car. I don't like sleeping in the car. And I got some really bad news, which is that the trip is canceled. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Rob's buddy tore his rotator cuff, he thinks, last night, because he can't move his arm. So he's not canoeing, and you know, I feel for him. That's the last thing you want early in the canoe tripping season. He might be out of commission for a while, so. Hope he's all right, but uh, on to plan B. There are endless canoe tripping opportunities around here. I can never do them all. So it's not like, I can't do that trip now, because it was a shuttle, we needed the cars. 
but there are tons of others that I can do. So on to the next one. It's a beautiful morning. It's potentially supposed to turn uh, to rain and even thunderstorms later. So I should get going. I have to now pick up my canoe and gear in a very inconvenient location, but uh, it won't set me back too much. Do you brush out here? Some people just don't brush when they're camping. Back on this road full of bears. It's a pretty good size one. And they all run away. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what you want to see. Now some sandhill cranes. There's just so much wildlife on this road, it's crazy. I also saw a moose earlier, I didn't get footage though. All right, back to square one. Gotta double carry my gear back to the car. It's almost a kilometer each way. And now I'm thinking about bears everywhere. Back to the gear, time to portage. Okay, on to part two of this trip. So the last three quarters of a day have not gone as planned, but the upside, saw five bears, two moose, four sandhill cranes, three or four hares, and two bald eagles for my, for my trouble. So, here I'm on another route that I'm super excited about, so really not too much loss, just the company. I was here last year with Joe, two things happened that are bringing me back. I caught a fish that I believe was a lake trout. Several people have said it was a tiger trout because it had very unusual coloration or patterning actually on it. So I'm here to see if I can get, get another one of those and kind of get some confirmation on that. The other thing, I lost my GoPro. It had some of the gnarliest portaging footage on it that I've ever recorded, probably the nastiest. So I'm on the hunt for that GoPro can't imagine I'm going to find it a year later. We scoured the place, looked everywhere for it last year, right after I lost it. But I'm going to give it a whirl. Feels pretty small, but I bet it's a little brook trout. Huh, no way. It's actually a lake trout. This is such a small lake. Thanks, buddy. I did not expect it to have the depth for lakers. Hey, it's a lake trout, eh? Um, this portage is, is horrendous. Black flies are uh, at maximum level almost. Uh, and we gotta get back over there. We've cleared and we've scouted and cleared it. And uh, I lost my GoPro on it. I'm using my secondary one right now. Uh, but we just need to get there and make camp. Let's just do it. I'm taking a breather here. Just complete brutality. This is a horrible portage. Yep. At the first portage, after a very scenic paddle, this fog is just racing through the lake. It's got to be blowing something in, so the faster I can get this done, the better. Oh man, that is a rough trail. Long, challenging, and just difficult to follow it. Here we are. All right, ugly parts over. Such a beautiful lake. Small, this island in the middle of it, and then a lake on either side of it, just separated by narrows. Pretty perfect. It 
Doesn't look like it from here, but that's home in there. It's actually a pretty cozy spot once you get in. Black flies haven't been bad today, and they suddenly just went crazy. Good to know this is here because it was hard to find anything with Joe last year. And it looks like quite a rat's nest at first, but there are some cozy spots. Look at that. There's a fire pit, some wood still. Thanks, Joe and previous me. Just started raining and I scrambled to get the tarp up. I hope there's a thunderstorm. I would love to ride out a thunderstorm in the hammock today. This is my favorite kind of campsite. Just rugged and untamed, unused. Aside from Joe and I, who knows if anyone's ever used it. Probably not. comes to camping trips, I tend to set my expectations too high. For instance, on this short trip, I hoped for a big thunderstorm this evening and then potentially northern lights tonight. Both were forecasted, but instead I'm probably just getting a gray night. And then I wanted to find my GoPro, which I tried last year, didn't happen. And then I want to catch another fancy lake trout, whatever it was. But in all likelihood, none of those four things are going to happen. And I spend so much time thinking about what I want to happen or what I hope will happen in the future that I, I, I'm not in the moment. And I find it's especially true as a YouTuber because I'm trying to put together some kind of theme or narrative for the video. And that is mostly predicated on things that are going to happen over the course of the trip. So I think I'm just going to reset my expectations for this trip. I'm going to enjoy this overcast evening. Tomorrow I'm going to go for a walk. If I find something, great. And then after that I'll go fishing. That's it. Whatever happens, happens. I think I'll enjoy it a lot more. This looks incredibly beautiful down that way. There's a creek leading to another lake. It's probably a slog, but it looks very tempting right now. Maybe before I'm gone, but I'm not gonna plan that. We'll see if I get to it. Wind is crazy today. Wow, I think these are fiddleheads. They're a bit too tall now. Actually, that one, the smallest one there is edible. I'm gonna keep an eye out. Might be able to get some fiddleheads today. Yeah, so these are fiddleheads. You can identify them with this U-shaped groove in the stem, this brown papery skin that falls right off very easily and the absence of hairs. And these small ones, those would be good to eat tonight. These ones here, they're too big. Once it's above six to eight inches, it becomes somewhat toxic. But yeah, these ones are too tall as well. But there's some for the picking.
See, here's one with hairs on it. This is not the one you want. And over here, that's the brown papery skin. So if you didn't see my trip with Joe last year, here's what happened. We were starting this exploratory trip here. We got into this lake and then we wanted to push ahead on our first day. The black flies were off the chain, like 10 out of 10. The terrain was very rough for portaging all of our gear through. I can't even find where we went now with virtually no gear on my back. And we were just exhausted and sweaty. And somewhere along the way on this portage, between here and the next lake, I know it was somewhere there, I lost my GoPro. My GoPro had all the footage on of, you know, the difficulty of the travel. And that was the hardest thing to lose. Not the GoPro itself, just the memory card. So I've been wanting to get it back ever since. But like I said last night, I'm just out for a walk in the woods. If I happen to stumble upon a GoPro, that would be lovely. The hills were one of the toughest things last year. It just goes up and down and with heavy loads, we packed quite heavily. It was rough. So I have last year's tracks on here. This is just a federal topo map using the Avenza Maps app, which shows my location there. We had found this goat path here and we were so optimistic. Even just walking up this is tough, it's steep. But it didn't really lead to much. Sweet little pond in between the lakes. So the GoPro is somewhere here between here and the next lake. But that's like a needle in the haystack. See anything? It's a bit painful knowing today that I might walk right past it and be a couple feet away from it. Probably will. If I don't find it, that is probably the, going to be the case. Oh man. Brings back memories getting back to this point. Joe and I, Worked so hard to get here, and we were so low by the time we did. But it's a really beautiful lake. I remember this spot. There's this huge plate-shaped mushroom here. So I did come through here. So here's the top of the peak. This is the last known whereabouts of the GoPro. I remember taking a shot up here, facing the lake, and that was the last I remember using it. Oh man, <laughs> saw this little black bit of dirt there, and from a certain angle, it looked like a black square, GoPro sized. Heart leapt a little. Stunning. I've been recording my track for a little while now, so I can see what I've covered. We did a ton of bushwhacking to scout and create a trail, so we went all over. Just so many places it could be. Well, I searched every logical place I could think of. No sign of it, so it was a nice walk in the woods. It was kind of fun though, felt like a hunt. So at least I'm getting some fiddleheads out of the deal. I'm going to take these small ones in the middle that are still curled up. Got a few dozen. Plenty for me for one meal. Now I just got to get back to camp. It's going to be a challenge in this wind. Trees sound like they're about to break down. Mm. <laughs> That's really good. It tastes similar to asparagus, which I really love.
Windbound all afternoon and into the evening now. And this north wind is brutally cold. I was getting really cold just reading there. So up and about, making some hot chocolate, got some goat cheese. It's not a bad evening. Oh, morning. Let's get the fire started. Wind settled down, eh? So far this trip's been all stuff that we've done before. Maybe today we'll explore something new. Yeah? All right. Just gonna get some brekkie done quick. Bear with me, man, sorry. So yeah, today I'm gonna try and head north. From this lake, I've been east, I've been west, I've been south. North I have put off because it looks like a nasty slog through a creek. But after being windbound most of yesterday, not really accomplishing much, I feel like I have it in me. If I get through, it looks spectacular on a map. Eight pieces of garlic bread with chili and cheese is a lot. This is a lot of food. So there's my camp, that red pin at the bottom. There's my location in blue. And I want to carry up through this creek. This should be the rough part. Once I get it into this lake, it should be fine. It looks clear anyway on a map, but sometimes the map lies. I'm just gonna send the drone up to do a little pre-scout. Probably gonna have to get wet here, and it is cold this morning. The sun just busted through on me, and that feels amazing, but if I'm gonna get cold, I wanna make sure this is gonna be there's some potential there at least. Well, I rarely get to say this, but the creek actually looks good. There's this beaver dam right at the start and then some other obstruction toward the end. And that's all I could really see. It's just enough water to paddle here. And I'm at that last obstruction before the lake. I can't believe how well that creek travel went. Never ceases to amaze me where I'll find a cash boat. I have no idea why. Like It's so shallow here, you'd have trouble getting the boat across. Not to mention you have to lift over the beaver dam. Anyway, trail looks pretty overgrown, but there is one here, so that's great news for me. Just a little clearing work. It's looking good again. Nice little falls just along the portage. Gorgeous. Oh man. So I'm coming out of the main basin on the lake. The lake narrows for a little while here and then opens up again. Beautiful beaver lodge here. What a home. Gorgeous little valley connecting these lakes. This is what it's all about for me. Bust your hump getting in, see something that almost no one ever sees. You just soak it up. The sun comes out for you. And you get these moments now and then. It all comes together. Okay, here is the last basin. Very nice. The cliffs aren't as dramatic as I thought they might be. 
up here. You can see some exposed rock, but mostly treed. Beautiful spot though. Wow, there's an old trapper's cabin in the woods here. Totally tucked away, I didn't see it at all except for the reflection of light off of a window. Hello? How perfect is this? I'm assuming it's a trapper's cabin. Hello? Hope it doesn't collapse on me. Feels pretty rickety. Not much in here. Not even a bed. Clean though. <laughs> Smells like kerosene. Cool. I did see an old spring here. Well, that was a cool find. Not getting the things that I expect on this trip, but Finding different things to make up for it. Fiddleheads yesterday, this today. Not to mention just the scenery is enough. Well, I've fished this lake pretty extensively and I've come up empty. So I'm going to get out of here and head to the one lake where we actually caught fish last year. Caught that special, unique looking lake trout, I think it was anyway. trout I caught last year was special. It just had very irregular patterning on it compared to most lake trout. Some people were saying it's a tiger trout. I agree it somewhat looked like it, but that should be impossible. I think it's just a particular pattern on that fish or maybe in the strain that's in this lake. I believe it's a lake trout, but anyway, I want to have another look. It was special, whatever it was. I was just stretching my legs and followed this creek up a little ways. Really nice spot for fiddleheads here. Nicer than yesterday, really. There are four nice ones. Let's see if I can collect some more. They were really good yesterday. Pretty good haul, plenty for one. It's exciting. Heading back to home base. Couldn't make it happen. I tried my absolute best, but I got fiddleheads to cook up and I'm gonna get a good hot fire going because it is cold, really cold. Feels good to be back. That was a full day. And getting back here, starting to feel like home. Like, I don't know, there was a real sense of comfort in being back here. So, feels good. Can't wait to eat these up. All of these things.
back to the access lake. There's one stop left before I finish up. As the first trip ended and I paddled away with no GoPro, no special trout, no aurora or thunderstorm, not even the route or company I'd planned, it was a reminder to relax my expectations for the rest of the year. Whether it's wildlife, a big fish, or northern lights, trying to force moments to happen on trips almost never works. They tend to happen unexpectedly when you simply make yourself available for a moment to arise. It was a great shift in perspective for the trips to come, but still a solid start to the year. Those really special moments would come. So if you're thinking, that sounds great, I'm going to quit my job and make camping videos too. I'll warn you, it wasn't quite that easy. It was years in the making, with countless hours invested, and took lots of sacrifices and planning. Between the next few trips, I'll sum up the story of how this all came to be. And if you don't care how it came to be, there are chapters in the playback bar if you want to skip ahead to the trips. But if you want to hear the full tale, here's how I turned my life upside down. I grew up in Toronto, studied commerce downtown at TMU, and sold cameras part-time at a mega mall until graduating in 2010. Back in my city days, I used to say that I could give up everything, live out nature off the land. I realize now just how hard and extreme that life would be, but also how deprived I was of wilderness, living most of my life trapped inside four walls in a city. Whether you work in an office, a factory, a store, a restaurant, school, vehicle, hospital, hotel, even home, any workplace can feel like a cage. The job doesn't own you, but it does own your time. Be it 9 to 5, weekends and evenings, day shift, night shift, part time, full time. For those hours, you are confined. And when you finally see the bars of your cage, the only thing you truly want is freedom. So that desire I had to live in the wild was real, just not realistic. Toronto is a great city, but I never belonged there, nor in any city. But after school, my life continued in the city with a job offer. I worked a 70th floor sales and marketing job where you could make six figures by your early 20s if you could climb the ladder. It was an office full of type A's and suits. And although the entry level positions weren't well paid at $32,000 a year, which is difficult in the city, the company skillfully dangled carrots in front of us to keep us hungry. There were promotions and bonuses, travel and restaurants, flashy meetings with mega corporations. And yet for all the glamorous aspects of the lifestyle, all I really wanted was to take my fishing rod and go north. My escapes into nature at the time were irregular and brief. Fishing the harbour front or the Humber River in Toronto's West End where I grew up, the odd weekend at a friend's cottage, or short car camping trips a few hours north of the city. I know what a privileged life this was, but that didn't mean it was fulfilling or that I belonged to it. The old school mentality is that you should never leave a good job, and if you don't like it, you just gotta suck it up. But I'd rather be poor and free than rich and trapped. At 23, my dark hair started to turn grey from the stress of the job, and I got passed up for a big promotion twice, despite long hours and good results. The second time I was up for the promotion, I interviewed with an exec in the New York office, and apparently he thought I sounded too young to get the role. I had to have the slowest puberty ever, and he wasn't wrong about my voice, but I was working my tail off, and it stung me on a very personal level. It turned out to be one of those painful moments that's a blessing in disguise. That rejection was crucial to cementing the feeling that I didn't belong, and awakening a dormant sense of rebellion. The plan for an escape began to take shape, and I started squirreling away some cash. My late grandfather was in poor health at the time, seeing as how he would no longer be driving, I was given his minivan. It was a champagne gold 98 Ford Windstar, a pure grandpa van, and I was ecstatic to have it. With that car, the north country I craved became that much closer. With some savings in the bank, I quit my job with great relief and satisfaction and flew to Santiago to spend a month in South America to ride out the rest of winter. The warmth and mountains there were a breath of fresh air compared to the cold and sterile skyscrapers I was used to. But the reality of most vacations is you're still on a timeline, often trying to catch a flight, or a bus, or a tour group, a reservation. So I was even more excited for my plans back in Ontario, where I'd be completely free from the constraints of a schedule. In May, I came home for spring in the Northern Hemisphere to take a huge road trip with my grandpa's van, my dad's big fiberglass canoe, and my fishing rod. My grandpa was a paper salesman in Toronto. My dad was a book salesman in Toronto. I thought I would be a salesman there too, but now I was gonna have to figure out what I was. For now, I was a traveler, and I was gonna drive all around the Northern parks that were always on my mind. The ones I stared at on maps while I was stuck in the city. Got a good one on here, folks. Oh yeah. Giving me a little toe here. Unbelievable fishing. <laughs> no. 
Well, folks, here it is. The one I've been waiting for. This 12 pound beauty was caught on a musky buck lure. All alone for weeks, moving and fishing as I pleased, sleeping in the back of the van whenever the day ended, the road trip was my first true taste of absolute freedom. I was on a tight budget and on cold nights I shivered for hours rather than shelling out cash for a motel. It just made sunrise that much sweeter and things like that forced me to build up my camping skills which were still very limited. I drifted from park to park, finally laying eyes on places I'd only dreamt about back in the city. But as the weeks passed, reality came back around and I knew that I would run out of money in a few months. So I made my way back to Toronto to get serious about job hunting. The road trip had been amazing, but that feeling of freedom faded fast once I got home. It didn't satisfy my wanderlust, it just opened the door to obsession. Let's move on to the next trip and get back to history in a bit. I'd have some company for the second trip of the season. I was headed for some remote trout lakes with Joe Robinette, who I'd been watching for many years. To many of us, Joe pioneered the idea of making camping YouTube videos for a living, and if he told me five years earlier that I'd be camping full time and dripping with Joe, well, that was not even remotely conceivable. Not to mention that for backcountry anglers, there's just about nothing better than an early season trout trip, even if that means lots of portages and black flies. Okay, here we go. The weather was unseasonably cold, so at least we could start without the flies for now. Yeah, I think it is hail. Yeah. So this route is a real wild card for us. We really have no idea what the condition of the route is, but there is a portage sign up ahead there, just past Joe's head. So that's, that's promising. Yeah, it was about 200 meters. Yeah. Measured it. Nice. One down. God knows how many <laughs> left to go. So we came through on the other end. Beautiful little lake, big pond. It makes you want to stop here, doesn't it? Searching for the next portage. Okay, so this looks like a trail. Fueling up before these portages. We have them marked on an old map, but no distances and the map is very low resolution. Okay, we're ready to go. Weather is just changing on a dime. It goes from hail to blue skies. Right now it's coming down pretty good. Listen, Listen to that. Man, it is wild out there, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bunch of portages oh, here really early. Right yeah, oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, just a bit of an awkward takeout. Beautiful. Nice. That wasn't bad at all. No, no. Oh. Just amazing pines. I am blown away by all the pine. Reaching it. <laughs> uh oh, tipping it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Bone dry. Yeah. Oh man. Cool. Wow. Cool. This is really well done. It's kind of bizarre. It's like, it's too precise. It's, uh, we'll take it. Stonehenge over here. Yeah. <laughs> just an incredible sight. What a day. Just needed a fish, but we got time for that. Well, yep. we're here. <laughs> Cheers, buddy. Cheers. We're getting camp set up here. Got my beloved Amok. And it looks like the weather's about to change again for the 50th time today. This site is magic. Magic. Camp five through the roof. 
Cheers. Cheers, boy. Brought to two tall boys each, and they didn't make it till dinner, first day. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, mm. Mm. that's good. It's really good. Mm. Back to the snow. It's been 20 minutes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the little weather icon showed snow, and I was like, ah. <laughs> it's crazy. I don't think I've ever had this this kind of snow on a canoe I, trip. I am right there with you. I think. Wow. Oh man, it's so beautiful. Living the life, boys. <laughs> Living the life over here. This is scenic, eh? Oh, man. Little channel. Dude, pitch, pitch a tent right there. <laughs> That'd be pretty, pretty sweet. Yeah. Decent shore fishing. Right. Sun just cracked through a bit. It feels really good. It's a very cool morning. Very blustery as well. All right, here it is. It's close. Lake or anything? Oh yeah! On the board. A nice lake trout. Little release. Amazing how quickly luck changes, eh? With the, with the change of allure. <laughs> the change of luck. Oh my goodness. Yeah, he's gonna fill that net. Another laker. Oh no, no, no! Ah! <laughs> Nobody... Oh, this is ridiculous. I'm going to bring my... Oh, no. Oh, oh no. Oh, yeah. There he <laughs> goes. Well, yeah, that's cheers. a pretty fish, man. We're on the board. Yeah. Okay, we're not messing with this net no more. Yeah. We're almost at the portage. We're almost looking forward to it. The wind's gotten pretty bad. Unbelievable trails. Considering we had no idea and we figured we'd be doing a fair amount of bushwhacking, we're blown away. Just off the trail, there's remnants of a cabin or something. Wow. Would have been the perfect size, eh? For just one or two people. Oh. Another beauty. That was an 1150. That was a lot longer than the other ones we've done so far. What do you have? Show me a speck. Oh my god. I saw color in that tail. That's a, uh, oh, it's a rainbow! Rainbow. Oh, it's a rainbow, buddy. Your neck, your neck. Yep. High pressure, high pressure. Oh, it's a beautiful rainbow. Beautiful. Oh my god. Beautiful rainbow. <laughs> Double rainbow. Double rainbow. What does it mean? Oh, oh thank you. No, it's that brookie. Oh, it is. It's, it was That's so a monster. Fat. It was so fat. I thought it was a. Uh, what is the color under it? It looks. It's, like... Yeah, it's got that iridescence of a rainbow. Oh my! That is a thick brookie, yeah, that's, buddy. That's a football. That's a thick fish. Beauty, man. 
Oh my goodness, I'm happy. Beauty. I'm happy. Okay, I'm gonna put this guy back, but awesome fish. Super happy about it. Very nice fish. Congrats. Thank you. Beauty. Joe has himself a triple crown. Just got into a rainbow. Laker, Brookie, and a rainbow. This could be one of the best fishing days of your life. Oh, it already is. Oh, yeah, Brookie, I think. Another beautiful brook. Three trout a piece. Oh, can't ask for anything more. Keeping the fish in the water there in the net. Let my hands before I handle it. Oh, just gorgeous. Okay. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much. Looks pretty good, eh? Yeah, I think so, dude. Yeah. Joe's just butterflying the trout, trying to open it up so it cooks more evenly. If you don't, everything around the spine is pretty raw by the time the outer pieces are cooked. So the gist of it, make a split, get it down as far as you want. The fish is pretty big so we need the fish to split down a little ways. We've got our skewers, I'll have my lovely assistant hold this for me. <laughs> Big. <laughs> Pull that side. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I'm worried I'm gonna crack no, it. No, I know. But... Yeah, it's a dangerous game. <laughs> How is it looking? Delicious. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. Sweet. That looks like we, I, we're bushcrafting now, you know? I'm, I'm part of the club. <laughs> we decided to add a side or actually an appetizer to this meal while we wait for it to cook. And what could be more gourmet to go with this rainbow trout than some craft dinner? Please look, half some more. Sweet, thank you. Yes. <laughs> That's plenty. That's no, plenty. No, no. That's plenty, dude. Thank you. Ooh, first cars. Sure. No, okay. Mmm. <laughs> She's fatty. <laughs> Cheers, buddy. Oh, mm. rainbow trout. Oh, wow. That is amazing. Mmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Like a bit of that smoky flavor. Mm hmm. Good morning. Beautiful, calm conditions. Sunny, not a cloud in the sky. And I can't wait to get back in the canoe. I haven't been that excited to fish in a while, but yesterday brought back that excitement. So I can't wait to just cook up breakfast and get going. Day three, it's been an amazing trip so far but we haven't even had conditions like this at all. It's been 
raining on and off, cold, windy. So this is what it's all about. Okay, through to the next lake. Goodness, just beautiful. All right, thank you. Oh man, I was watching an eagle up there when I hooked up with another beautiful brookie. Just another beautiful, beautiful trout. So we're on the river now. This is a real wild card. If it dries up, then uh, we're gonna have a long day. Beautiful clear water. So far we're getting through. It's been a grind to get down this river. Oh, it might be a rainbow. It's a rainbow. It's a rainbow. It's a rainbow. Come on. Oh, it's fighting well. There we go. Oh, rainbow. Oh, rainbows for all. Look at that. Let him go right away. Thank you very much. Awesome. There's a big climb here. We have nothing in the tank. I'm probably gonna not make camp for another two hours or more. That's the lake that we just left from. A lot of elevation gain. Hopefully we're at the top and it's uh, down from here, but it doesn't really look like it. Made it. Exasperated, but also super excited. Just a relief. Oh wow, over here too. Oh wow. This is why we do it, eh? All right, this is gonna be it for us tonight. Sun's low and we're too exhausted to uh, search for anything else. A better site. This is somewhere we can sleep and cook food and drink water, that's all we care about. Oh, to a day? To a day. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Paddling on glass on these spectacular lakes which have such clear water. Seems like our luck with the trails is over. Real bird's nest here. Cleared a little sneak around it, but it's a lot of this on this trail. 1800 meters. Taking a breather here. After the last 24 hours, we've been really worn down. Hopefully this is the last tough one.
Oh, real stunner of a little lake. Yeah, cool. Joe just found the shed. Isn't that cool, eh? Not that big. But beautiful. That's the first moose shed I've ever found. Same. Actually, no second. But it's got some heft to it, though. Rare. Oh, they're heavy, eh? Yeah. Oh, I'd like to keep it, but I'm not going to. No, we got enough to carry. <laughs> no Look at that, though. That's pretty cool, man. Nice, good eye. Hard to see in the leaf litter. There's a big, steep drop descent here into this lake. Glad we're going this way. Taking the gear up this would be brutal. Joe actually wiped out right here. A rock gave out. His camera lens smashed right on that rock, but miraculously, seems to be all right. And him. <laughs> Done for the day. All right, looks like we might have found a little well deserved slice of paradise here. All right, we're going for a dip. We got a perfect jumping rock on this A1 campsite have to use it even though the water is freezing freezing <laughs> i'm gonna give my clothes a rinse while i'm at it we're doing this together i think so all right amped up get me amped up you ready i think so one <laughs> two three <laughs> oh, oh that, was, that was some bigger in. Okay. So I've eaten meat three times on this trip. Joe brought steak. Joe provided rainbow trout. Joe provides beef. Four day old beef. Or Pork, I guess. Pork beak, whatever. Whatever's in a sausage. I don't think anyone knows. No one knows. Squeeze it. Already all backpack dogs. Mmm. Little ketchup. Yeah. Mm. What a morning. That was a beautiful night. Stars were out, it was completely clear. We went without the fly because it was clear. An owl perched right overhead in these trees, a barred owl and was hooting. And the loons were going, gull was chirping away. The ambiance was off the charts. A big pot of cheesy veggie chili with some garlic bread. And trying to fuel up because we want to put in a big day. Hopefully make up some ground. I'd say every day we made less ground than we thought, so. <laughs> Hopefully today we change that. Saying goodbye to that fantastic campsite and to our first portage of the day. Should have several, hopefully, if we can get them done.
nice jump in rocks here. This is the trail. This is the green trail mm -hmm. that I said. We, we came off on this one. We're coming here. This is the green trail that would have intersected it. But on that this, it looks like we should head straight through there, right? That's what we're trying to do. Yep. And this trail goes and stops right there. Okay. Flies are really coming on. Okay, three portages connecting the two lakes, a couple ponds in between. We're on our way. It's funny, we have several mapping resources for this trip. Joe has a Garmin GPS, I've got Avenza Maps on my phone. I've got, I believe, Kevin Callan's old map of this route, and Joe has a different printed map that he bought at a store near him. And none of them really agree. And sometimes uh, one of them is wrong. Some other times that same map is right, and the other ones are wrong. It's, it's caused a lot of confusion for us on this trip, but it's made for a great adventure. Not knowing the way sometimes is the most rewarding trip. Finding your way. Oh, it's definitely rain up ahead. I can see it with my sunglasses on at least. Yet again, we're searching for a portage. It looks like water levels have changed a lot because this is all marsh. We finally found the flag there. So I guess that's our way to go, but. I'm gonna put on my bug shirt, but we're close to camp. It's right over there, it's in sight, so I'm hoping I don't have to. Got a smoky fire going. Hopefully ditch him. So we checked out the campsite, it seems decent, but we just we feel like carrying on. There's just like a 160 meter portage to get to the next lake. We still have plenty of daylight. And the next lake is stocked pretty heavily with splake. Well, if we could get Splake, that'd be every trout species in the area, basically. True, that would be the Grand Slam! Grand Upgrade cool. that triple crown to a Grand Slam! Last night, finally out for an evening paddle just to fish and relax. Joe went out about an hour ago and he got a splake. So he's upgraded his trout triple crown to a trout grand slam. Rookies, rainbows, lakers, and now splake for him. So pressure's on me now. Fish on. Hoping for the Grand Slam. Looking for a splake. Yes! It's in the net. It's thrashing, the water's pretty dark. I'm thinking splake though. Here's the moment of truth. 
That looks like a splake to me. Bit of a fork in the tail. And that is the grand slam, my friends. Grand slams, trout grand slams for both of us. For a couple of buddies, that is a heck of a fishing trip. And there is a magical sunset. Unbelievable. Hey, uh, I know you're in the Grand Slam Club. I was wondering if you'd let me in. Oh, yeah. Nice, man. <laughs> We're in the corner on the little Cleo. Good stuff, buddy. Yeah. That's perfect. Home runs yeah. for both of us. <laughs> Congrats, man. <laughs> Well, we're in the home stretch here. We've got some pond hopping to do, and then one known portage that we've already done to get back to our access lake, and then we're out of here. Joe is in more of a rush than I am, so he's gonna jet ahead, clear all the trails, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's the reason. <laughs> <laughs> but that was an amazing trip. Very good, right up there with one of the more memorable ones, man. I know that already, and I haven't even like gone back and then look at the footage or yeah. try to remember it yet. Yeah, it's gonna be a fun one to look back on. Yeah. Yeah. Hasn't even ended yet. <laughs> yeah, right. And look at look at the goldeny uh just a gorgeous morning too. Yeah. We've had amazing weather. Yep. Incredible. All across the board. Even the snow, it was kind of magical. Saddle up right here, just soak this in. Yesterday I was content with going home. We really miss Aaron, body is wrecked, but uh, this morning it's feeling harder to leave. It's just so peaceful, and I'm really in my zen state now on day six. Kind of day seven for me, because I camped the first night at the access point. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the next one. Into the first pond. There are, I think, five or six, so gonna be a lot of pond hopping. Short portage, short portage. Another boggy one. Seven buggy, boggy portages later. I'm back at the access lake. Feels really good to have all the portages behind us. We had some tough ones on that trip. It was an amazing trip with Joe. Extremely memorable. After a spring canoe trip that trout anglers dream of, I packed up and hit the road to rest and resupply at home, hammer out some edits, and spend some time with Aaron. Full-time camper life was starting off as hoped, but let's go back again to how this became possible. Eight years before the trip you just saw, I was returning to reality after a month in South America and the northern road trip in my grandpa's minivan. I came back to my low-rise apartment in Toronto and started applying for jobs that would bring me closer to nature. Being the oldest of three siblings, I was a rule abider and I had my sights set on becoming a conservation officer. I think I would have been damn good at it too, but I cast a wider net applying to places like parks and resource management companies. But with my education and experience being in a totally unrelated field, I was getting nowhere fast and eventually I was getting nowhere slow. 
Thankfully, I was splitting the rent with my best friend Chris, which bought my bank account a bit of time. But as summer wore on, I began to lose hope that any conservation or parks organization would give me a chance. Eventually, a recruiter contacted me, and before I knew it, I was working another marketing job. This time in the city of Mississauga, just west of Toronto. It was a pretty good role with an agency that ran in-store promotions in Walmart. Like my last marketing job, we created promotional materials in the millions for mass distribution across the country. This really gnawed at me. Forcing landfill onto consumers to convince them to buy stuff they probably didn't need from a company that had been the face of consumerism in my lifetime. I'm not saying the marketing doesn't have its place. People have real needs and there are products that make our lives better. But I remember a promotion we organized for a toaster made specifically for hot dogs, and it makes me cringe. There were sugary snacks, new products touting meaningless awards that were bought more than earned, cheap gadgets that would be landfill in no time. How do you push consumerism for a living when your core values are about conservation? The work-life balance was better with this job, and there were a lot of good times with good friends, but I could never reconcile those feelings. I knew I could either continue like that for the next 40 years, or reinvent myself in my late 20s before it was too late. And after almost three years in the job, and since the last big adventure, the camping itch had returned with a vengeance. I'd spend hours looking at maps and thinking about where to go, and imagining what fish might be in the lakes. Yet again, I began planning my escape, but this time I'd be smarter about it and have a real plan. Change starts with hope, but is executed with a plan. After months of preparation and saving, I told my boss I was leaving to do a college diploma to transition my career to something in nature. i had been squirreling away money again to pay for school, and if I lived on the cheap, I could quit four months before the first term to get in some serious camping. I sold much of what I owned, but I felt like I needed to make one big acquisition. My dad's heavy fiberglass canoe needed an upgrade if I was gonna be doing this all summer. I bought my first canoe from a small shop in Hamilton, Ontario. It was a 15-foot prospector model, an expedition-grade Kevlar, a terrific boat for adventure. And at about $1,500 with some upgrades and paddles, it was a really good deal. I set out in May as soon as the ice melted, and I was in the clear until the end of August, when I'd have to get ready for school. I kept a journal that summer, but at the time, I was only taking pictures and very rarely short video clips with a point-and-shoot camera. Life was not glamorous, but it was beautifully simple. At one point I remember going three weeks without a shower or even a swim because the water was too cold in May and I didn't want to waste money on accommodations. I was eating simple packaged foods along with the odd fish, my gear was very basic, and the van continued to be my motel when needed. But I was free and happy as could be. And unlike the first escape, this time I had a concrete plan to come back to real life and transform my work into something I cared about. With this vision for the future, I was able to enjoy the moment all the more. My thoughts tend to be dominated by the future, but for once, I was in the present. For the first time since I could remember, I made time to read books for fun. I fished and went wherever the wind blew me, guided by some invaluable maps I'd bought. I mostly picked out routes in the Tomogamy region, and it was here where I learned the ropes of solo backcountry camping. For the most part, I stuck to public land, outside of operating parks, where I could camp for free to stretch my budget. As summer wound down, I dreaded having to end this lifestyle, but I was also excited to begin a fresh start with school. But before I open that chapter, let's get back to tripping, because this next one was really special. One of the best trips of my life. Hey, gorgeous. To get to my start point, Aaron shuttled me three hours west of home to an old silver mining town in what is now a sleeping giant provincial park. From there, I intended to paddle over 200 kilometers east to the small coastal town of Rossport. refuge in this little bay. I'm kind of stuck already. This is this is kind of what you don't want to happen here. Waves are up, there's two, three foot swells, wind is up, an onshore wind, thick fog, 
So it's pretty much the worst conditions for navigation. So I'm just gonna wait it out. I promised Erin I would be safe. She's usually pretty cool about my trips, but she was understandably anxious about this one. So uh, I owe it to her to play it safe. So I'm here in the canoe on the water, waiting it out. Not so bad. The skies have cleared up and the sun has burnt off the fog. Now I can see islands in the distance and such, which is all I need to navigate here. Carry on. That landform coming into view there is the sleeping giant. What a sight. All right. Buckle down. I'm on a small island here, Middlebrun Island. And I'm at a bit of a critical juncture. We've got Sleeping Giant behind me at the end of the Sibley Peninsula. It's on the north shore of Lake Superior here. And over there, and the, far in the distance are the Pops. A nice little mountain range, if you call them mountains, hills at least. And now I need to do a large crossing. And conditions I feel like are safe for me to do that right now. So I'm inclined to do it. Alternatively, they could camp here, see what happens this evening, make the crossing in the evening or in the morning when it's likely to be calmest, but I've got a tailwind. The, the rollers are pretty gentle, so I feel like I can do this safely. I'm just taking a moment here to, to really think it through. I'm gonna give it a shot, at least get out there a little bit and see how I feel. I can always backpedal, but I think this is my chance. I got a nice tailwind. The rollers are pretty gentle, so this is it. That island out there is about three kilometers almost away, and that's my next point of refuge. to the first island, which is occupied by gulls. They don't like me. And I can camp on some islands over this way, if need be. Daryl said you can camp there in a pinch, or I carry on. Just checking out the island. It seemed like a worthwhile stop either way. Pretty unique and incredible view here. It is tempting to camp, but conditions seem even better over here. That's the Porphyry Lighthouse over there. It's quite a bit of history. I'd like to visit, you're allowed to. I'm not sure it's in the cards based on the, the wind and my schedule. Pretty thick bush in here. Not the best for camping. Just gonna check the weather again. Looks like the weather's gonna be okay if I wanna go across. This is the Sibley Peninsula, Sleeping Giant there. That's where I launched. That's where I am. And then I just need to get across here and then I can camp in that red dot there if I like. Whoa. <laughs> Almost went for a plunge. But I'm in a dry suit, so it doesn't really matter, does it? Okay, onward. I don't want to camp here. Conditions seem perfectly reasonable. Let's keep her going. So I'm heading for Hard Scrabble Island over there. Great name. There's a sailboat right by it, another one. There's actually a, quite a sailing and yachting culture here on the North Shore of Superior, which is pretty cool. Maybe if I'm lucky, they'll invite me aboard for some cocktails and lobster. 
There's your big boy. Just coming into Horseshoe Cove. I think this will be home for tonight. I was beginning to wonder if there was a campsite here. But it is right here and it is really sweet. Just up in this clearing here, there's a bench, fire pit, nice landing here on this pebble beach. Perfect. And according to Daryl and Zach's guidebook for this area, it's supposed to be a little trail to take me over to a beach where I can get a sunset view. But first order of business is getting out of this dry suit. I'm eager to get it off, but it was so great to have it for peace of mind and safety. Oh, that could have been a white knuckle paddle if I didn't have this insurance policy. Oh, it feels good. Oh. Really nice. Just nowhere to hang a hammock, really, though. Here's that trail. Just 10 meters down the trail. Nice beaver lodge. This trail is a really nice little X factor for this campsite. And this should be a great place for sunset. Because this is a coastal trip, pack some luxuries, a liter of red wine. 6.30, just gotta yeah, make dinner, set up the hammock, that's it for today. Fantastic day, I feel accomplished for pushing through that and getting that big crossing done. That's the biggest crossing of the trip, so everything else should be more straightforward. So anyway, cheers. Oh yeah. <laughs> Found a spot to sneak in the hammock here, right beside the actual campsite. Got a few souvenirs out of this fire pit to take home, but not too bad. Oh, there's a message from Erin. I just sent her a text on the Zolio saying that I made it across. Got some old man's beard here, which Usually lights like gasoline, but it's a little damp, just slightly. It'll go. It'll go, I said. Oh, a mosquito flew right into the flame. Awesome! Veggie chili, lots of beans. Mmm, mmm. Oh, I needed that. Didn't stop for lunch. So that tastes extra good. Hunger is the best seasoning. There's a lot of history in this area. First Nations history going back thousands of years. But an industrial history as well. Forestry, fishing, mining. No idea what this is, but it was right there. Still in strong shape, built to last. And the marina where I launched today, Silver Islet, was in the 70s and early 80s the most lucrative silver mine on earth. Now it's just full of nice little cabins right by the water. Well, I've got everything done that I need to do for the evening and for a quick start tomorrow morning. Even charred some firewood on the fire so it's you know charcoaly. And I'm gonna go check out the sun. It's not gonna be sunset yet. You have to stay up pretty late this time of year to see the sunset. So I'm just gonna see what I see at this point in time and hit the sack. I wanna get a good start tomorrow morning. Hopefully get some calm paddling. And I'm sure I'll have lots of sunsets yet to come.
quarter after five. Time to get up. I can hear waves splashing already, so it must not be that calm. So today I want to make it to Stanton Island, where there's supposed to be a nice view of the Pops, that little mountain range. That's it. That's my goal for the day. And I want to fish. Time to get back into the dry suit. I'm just going to do it halfway, not the top. And then if I get into some nastier water, I'll just zip up the top. My favorite time of the day. Camp chores are done, full belly, full day to look forward to. Fantastic morning. Sleeping giant back there. He's waking up. I'm waking up. Poor free lighthouse is just over there. And I would love to see it, but I just don't have time to see it properly. And with the nature of this trip, there's so many islands, channels, and bays. I cannot see everything. Cool fact about this conservation area, it's the largest piece of protected fresh water on Earth. Pops coming into view again. Starting another open water crossing, a little over two kilometers, much calmer conditions than yesterday. I'm gonna do this up just in case. It's like being born. This guy just made an emergency landing here. <laughs> Came out of nowhere and just crashed into me. Anyway, he gets sanctuary here as long as he wants, or she. It's Magnet Island over there. Go halfway through the crossing, look behind me. Same view in front of me. This is why I'm wearing a full dry suit. The average annual water temperature in Superior is only four degrees Celsius. That's only a few degrees above freezing. Really a lake that deserves a ton of respect and caution. Oh, we got, we got, oh, he's alive. He's alive, folks. Come aboard, welcome. So Magnet Island is called that because I guess it has some kind of magnetic disturbance and it can actually throw off a compass by 30 degrees. Came to shore to stretch my legs. And surprisingly, someone has been here already. A moose. Interesting to see that all the way out here. Porcupine, no way. I'm wondering what that was. It's just coming in here to have some lunch. It's only the second or third porcupine I've ever seen. On, a, on an island way out here. Cool. Hello. So awesome. <laughs> That's as fast as I've ever seen a porcupine move. Fantastic. Such a rare wildlife setting for me at least. Looks 
like a laker. Yep. Keep it in the water. Arbless hooks. Too easily. Nice little lake trout. Would be a good eater. But not right now. I really want to get camp set up before the storm potentially rolls in. There are thunderheads all over there and pretty dark clouds, so that's my priority right now. It's Hugh Island behind me and two hook kilometers of open water ahead of me is Stanton Island. That's where I'll set up. Just heard the first booms of thunder. I'm pulling into camp right there. Perfect timing. Okay, tarp's up. Got a great view of the paps and hopefully a thunderstorm. That would be cool. It's amazing how much these trees deflect the wind. As soon as I step out here, way stronger. Passed out for two or three hours. Only sprinkled unless I slept through more. But still looking nasty that way. It's just been, it's been all around, but I haven't gotten any of it yet. So I'm hope I'm cooking dinner and hoping it'll hold off while I do that. Beautiful beach site. I'm really digging this spot. Amazing panoramic view. Right as I took my last bite of dinner, it started to rain. Perfect timing. Thunder off in the distance. It's always been an off and off in the distance but it's creating such an ambiance here with the Swainson's thrush, my favorite bird call. And this view, really off the charts. I kind of want to go to bed early. Uh, I might have a north headwind tomorrow and I'd like to get an early start to get the beat on that. But I think I'm going to have to stay up for sunset. A rainbow. Wow. What a morning. Rainbow over the pops.
was up at 5 a.m. with the birds on the water just before 6 a.m. Just beat the buzzer at 5.59 a.m. Beautiful and calm, the wind was picking up and it just died, so that is a relief. Wow. Oh man, this moment is going to disappear. Just trying to soak it up. It's turning into a double. We got a double rainbow, folks. Best way to start any day. Lucky charms. Showers just started, and oh my goodness. Got a triple rainbow. One, two, three, four. There's a fourth rainbow. No way. Hope that's visible. That is unreal. I know I'm being the double rainbow guy right now, but that's four rainbows. Oh my goodness. Wow. What a morning. We're on the other side. I only see three, but three is still a lot of rainbows. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Unbelievable. Have you ever seen a quadruple rainbow? Have you ever even heard of one? Have you seen a triple? What did I just witness? That was ridiculous. I'm exploring Sturgeon Bay this morning. Don't really know why, it's like probably a 10 kilometer detour and no real notable features other than the mouth of the Sturgeon River which is hardly a river at all on the map. It's only shown as being a few kilometers long. Beautiful. The sandhill cranes. They're huge. I saw its red head popping above the grass there, and they took off before I could start the camera. But beautiful. There they are. Dead ahead. Massive birds. Whoa! Spider webs! <laughs> Big spider webs. I guess I can see why this is called a river. It's not a long one. It's uh, kind of eerie. Probably almost never paddled. And I mostly came in here for the hope of wildlife, like moose, and I got sandhill cranes, so gladly take that. So quiet, still. Having lunch on this little island. It's got more of this big plant. I'm wondering if it's Devil's Club, which is something that's mentioned in the guidebook. It's kind of unusual. Whatever it is, it's just crawling with insects. Oh. Let me kind of swarm you. <laughs> Oh, 
I don't know if it's this island or it's these plants, but it smells like poo. It's not that appetizing, but the burritos, very good. This archipelago is just incredible. Beautiful little islands and with this aqua marine water, they look so tropical. So alluring. All of them make you want to camp on them. Until they smell like poo. Oh, look at those bubbles. Oh, 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 we just got off. <laughs> oh, well. Just coming into South Loon Harbor now. It's a cluster of islands. It provides a really nice sheltered area for anchorage or for camping. And it looks spectacular. So it looked like a campsite here. Pulled up on shore. And uh, I was wondering why there are chairs here and everything. It's because this is a sauna. Believe it or not, there's a network of saunas on Lake Superior. Wow. It's actually like a log sauna. Everyone decent? Oh man. Oh, it smells beautiful in here like an old cedar cabin oh that's so cool i'm not really the sauna type but this is pretty neat even a mirror how do i look very cool moss chinking it looks like they set up curtains to kind of conceal it that's interesting. And I would camp here, but it's a bit used for my liking on a wilderness trip. This would be an amazing place to come with Aaron. Going in the sauna alone sounds kind of lonely. And I have a campsite picked out for tonight on Lasher Island anyway, so. But what a spot. I just love it here. It's like being on Lake Superior, but on an inland lake with no portage. It's just sweet. There used to be something here in Loon Harbor. There's like an old crib underneath whatever these parts are for. This maybe a boiler. Really don't know my machinery, my 1950s machinery too well. Those parts are just over there in that bay. Here's another one. Man, like rock solid stuff back in the day. And then this is a campsite here on this big slope, which I just want to walk up to give you a perspective on Loon Harbor. This, this harbor is enclosed by big islands, and then it's dotted with small islands all in the middle. So just a beautiful spot. Notice some geese poop. <laughs> Look at that little guy. Oh. There they are. There was some geese poop on the slope there. They were tucked away, but that one gosling just came running down the hill toward me, jumped in the water, started swimming toward me, and I just thought better of it. Pretty amazing campsite here on this exposed rock. Someone must have gone OCD someday and organized all this firewood. Unless a storm blew it all up, but I find that hard to imagine. It's not even four o'clock, but I've been up and at it since five and my wrist is done for the day, so this'll do. Should be 
a great dinner. Non calzones. On the water at 5.45 this morning, earliest start yet. Lake trout? Yeah, I think so. Yep. Wow, this one is really cool. It looks like this little leg is holding up this entire little cliff. This is absolutely amazing. Bashand Island. So worth this little detour this morning. I could have, I had to head south to get here and I'm going north. Is it ever worth it? Actually some little grasses and stuff growing on that rock. But how does that survive millennia of waves and ice and storms? That's incredible. Oh, the best is yet to come from Bashand Island. I thought I had seen the sea arch. I had not. I see it now. Wow. Oh my goodness. Creepy thing is, I can see like little pinholes of light through the rock. Looks like it could collapse at any second. Like this is quite an overhang. Let's see it from the other side. I thought yesterday morning would be impossible to top with that quadruple rainbow, uh, but this might have done it. Yeah, nice, thick, good length lake trout. Come here. Oh yeah. Probably a five pounder, maybe even six. What my hands. Oh yeah. It's a nice, nice lake trout. Oh no! Stupid idiot. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Just imagine a lake trout the size Double the size of the ones that I've got. <laughs> Shot at redemption here. This one doesn't feel nearly so big though. Yep, small lake trout. Let it pop off here underwater. Interesting spot here on Arthur Island. Just so raw and harsh. Only small trees, and some of them are probably quite old. Just can't get big, no soil. Nice cliffs across the channel.
scenery is always changing here. It's always dramatic. So beautiful. Fish on. Hope it's a brookie. I just have a, a feeling in this bay. Oh yeah, it's a brookie. It's a brookie. It is a brookie! <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, okay. First brookie of the trip. I thought I missed one earlier too. Ah, cool. Alright, wet my hands. Beauty. Square tail, red dots, blue halos. Alright, thank you. Thank you very much. You, eh? Check this out. It's always creepy going beneath these things, but you have to remember they move in geologic time. That won't collapse for probably millennia. I'm into Shishi Bay, and I was planning on going right to the back of the bay, which is about eight kilometers from here. But the wind is against me, and then it would be against me again coming out tomorrow. So I'm just going to cut across the mouth of the bay and carry on. Just listen to the lake. It's been over two kilometers across Shishi Bay, and I promised Aaron I would wear the suit. I was doing a big crossing, but it is brutally hot. It's so hot with this suit on. Pretty choppy, but not as bad as day one. That was by far the least pleasant paddling. This is fine. Picked up. strong there. Once I started going with the wind, I was flying. Very unusual rocks here, like columns. Water Island, what an amazing place. Another spectacular island. I shouldn't be surprised anymore, but I am. All right, I'm turning away from Water Island. One more crossing, and then I should be protected by the mainland from this north wind. I think this is called Sail Rock just sitting out here like an iceberg. Found camp for the day, and I think it's my favorite yet. Got a nice little babbling brook. Massively wide view. I can even see my old friends, the Paps, over there. Nice stony beach. And there's a lake a little ways that way. And I was wondering about bushwhacking into it. And there's actually, it looks like there's 
a trail. That might be fun to check out. It's four o'clock, so I probably have time to do that. And there's actually places to hang the hammock, which has been kind of a challenge. It's been better for tents, actually, which is, I don't say that too often. Yeah, little trail. And this is an interesting place to have a trail because this is wild, remote. You have to boat a long way, even by motorboat, to get here. That trail petered out pretty quickly. Might have just been a game trail. Hmm. Yeah. Looks really shallow. And it became a real tangle to get in here, so... Forget it. Goes on beyond. Could be deeper over there. Maybe it's a brook trout honey hole. But I've got a pretty good lake where I came from. that sound was earlier. Huh. Just a beaver. Morning, little beaver. 5.36 a.m., new best time. I'm leaving Dawson Creek and this cloud of mosquitoes behind. And it was actually a former logging camp right there. I, was, I felt like some of the trees looked planted just because they were too orderly. And yeah, I was reading the guidebook last night. And it said that, and yes, it is called Dawson's Creek. This little cave in there if you needed a shelter. No time to check that out though. Gotta get around this point to see sunrise. Never enjoyed mornings more on any trip. Day five. Those beavers were awesome last night. Beavers aren't usually that interesting. You know, you see them swimming and they splash their tail and they're gone, but when you actually get to watch them, pretty cool. And I was just lying in the hammock and then heard these little cries. And I was thinking, what the heck is that? If you've never heard a young beaver cry before, it sounds a lot like a human baby or toddler. It's weird. Mom! <laughs> and yeah, if you're not expecting to hear a baby's voice <laughs> in the wilderness, it's pretty weird. But I've heard it before and I should have known, but it's been a while. Just looking at a big nest, wondering if it could be an eagle. And Mama just came home. Or Papa. It's 
funny how uncool an eagle's call is. That's why they always use red-tailed hawks in movies. <laughs> Water checking me out. I like her. Brought this little bat just for this purpose. If I needed to dispatch one quickly. Like that fish was just hooked near the eye. I don't want to rip that out. That just for humane purposes, that has to be a keeper. And I was looking for a fish to keep today anyway, so that's perfect and it's yeah. A nice nice eating size. For one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another Laker. Mind-boggling scenery in this spot. Just uh, south of Spar Island. I would love to stop here and clean that trout. There's a massive beach here, very long beach. But I'm paddling on glass and I have to cross the Nipigon Strait, which is kind of a notorious passage, so. I think I'll continue and try and get that done and then once I'm across, then I can have my fish reward. That hilly region up there is Fleur Island. I had no idea it was so scenic. Just like that, the wind picks up. Stiff breeze from the east just kicked up as predicted on the Zolio, which I keep here in my life jacket pocket. It's also my SOS beacon. I'm at the start of the Nipigon Strait. About two kilometers to get across here. Reel in. Chop's picking up, but it's still perfectly reasonable. About 80% of the way and in the lee of Fleur Island now. Felt like a long haul, but it was it was pretty straightforward. The wind didn't kick up too badly. Found this big piece of timber down the beach. Dragged it down here because it'll make a nice cutting board. And uh, Lay this guy up. He's pretty stiff now. Rigor mortis. Mmm. Oh, I can smell it from here. Mmm. Digging the lemon pepper. Mmm. <laughs> Seagull's taking on the eagle. They both have an eye from the uh, carpus, carcass. I'm shocked that the seagull actually won. For now, anyway. Been waiting so patiently, I laid it on the rock for him. And now that the eagle showed up, he's just <laughs> gobbling it down. Ugh, eating the fins. Yeah, you might be too small for the carcass. The eagle might get that. Oh, eagle's coming back. Huh. The eagle took flight. Oh. Oh wow. Oh. 
<laughs> what have I done? Man, the eagle has this eagle covered in every dimension. Except scrappiness. Oh. He's just a wiry scrapper and he'll take on anyone. <laughs> oh! One of them just pooped. Just landed in the water right there. That was close. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> He's like choking on that intestine. He's back. Beautiful rocks on this beach, well most beaches on Superior, but really nice quartz. They look better even when they're wet. Just look at those jewels. I remember the good old days when I was a kid and thought I could get rich off of these. It was a simpler time. Just removing any trace of my fire pit. So it looks clean. That's my idea of a shore lunch right there. Delicious. I wasn't being hounded by mosquitoes as I cleaned the fish, which often in summer can make it so unpleasant. And I got to share it with a couple of friends. There goes that wimpy eagle. Heading into Fleur Island, the archipelago south of it. Tons of islands. They're just everywhere. the main lake back out there and up along here there's a forest fire it looks like it's not too old because there's no regrowth yet here's camp for tonight beautiful wide view of St. Ignace Island we'll get to that later and a really nice sheltered area to camp in here. Perfect for the hammock. Almost done this book. Desert Solitaire, Edward Abbey. It's aged extremely well. It's over 50 years old, but it's still edgy. It's very good, very fitting for today as well. And there's one quote that really stands out here for that makes me think of Superior. Gaze not too long into the abyss, lest the abyss gaze into thee. Sometimes looking out at Superior, like an ocean, when you have a, a wide open view of it, it kind of feels like that. And next up, I've got this. Gorgeous sunrise over San Ignis Island this morning. Stiff breeze, stiff headwind is already up. It's uh, 5.42, so I'm glad to be on the water early. This could be a nasty one. We're crossing the blind channel now for St. Ignace Island. Made it. I'm very excited to be approaching St. Ignis Island. It's a massive island, second largest on Lake Superior behind Isle Royale. It's got lakes on it, big lakes actually, within it. It's uh, got one of the highest 
points of land in Ontario in Mount St. Ignace. But the scenery that I've got en route to getting here is going to be tough to beat. So we'll see what it brings. It's getting quite choppy out there. We just came onto this island for a breather. That's Mount St. Ignace over there, looking all dark and mysterious. Might be a short paddling day at this rate. the mouth of the Brook River here, pouring out, crashing into the waves, quite a nice spot, and I found a new souvenir, my, my usual, I've got quite a few of these, oh there's, uh, it's half full. Arch here in Duncan Cove, and you can paddle right through it. <laughs> oh, well, that's fun! <laughs> oh man, that is awesome! Nice looking beach. Stopped for lunch here on this beach in Duncan Cove. And while I was cooking up my penne, I found this. I think it's an agate. Agate. Rock. And if it is, it's the first one I've ever found. There are geodes which look all like crystal-y, but an agate has these concentric rings. So I think this would qualify. It's small, but I think it still counts as that in focus. Hopefully. Anyway, I'm pretty stoked about that. This laker actually got hooked on the bottom of the jaw on the outside. I'm just gonna film him on the underwater, let him pop off. Coming around Grebe Point, it looks so tropical. The shoreline looks like it's pure beach, although it's probably all gravel. And the little mountains. Yeah, I thought this point was gonna be a total war zone. Very shallow too, so the waves can really lift up on it. And they are, but not that badly. I'm able to paddle just fine. And Mount St. Ignis is just coming into view here and it's now lit by the sun. It's backlit before, it looks epic. What an amazing spot. This rock is mind boggling. And it's pretty common here. I'm protected behind a reasonably long point. And I don't really have it in me to go tackling whatever is around that point in terms of wind and waves. So I'll camp here if, uh, if I can find somewhere to actually hang the hammock. Exfoliation.
Well, we've killed a, I don't know, a couple hours, maybe even more in this spot. It's a beautiful spot. I've enjoyed it. I've got that wavy feeling in my head when you've been on the water with waves for too long. It's kind of nice. And I could conceivably camp here, but I don't, it's not great, and I don't really want to scar this pristine site with a fire. So, found somewhere else I can go just down the, the shore. And that'll do for tonight. Took the canoe over to the camping spot. The stuff's crying out because it ended up being a bit of a surf landing. Everything's drying out except for my souvenir from Brook River. But all is well. It's sunny, so dry. Ah. All set up in the muck. Fantastic view. Here's my impromptu washing machine. I've got my shirts and pants, shirt and pants in the net, along with a few pebbles, so it's not uh, too light and doesn't go away on me. And this net has a tether, so I just latch it on the canoe here. Rinse cycle. Modern Family, there's an episode where Cam and Mitch talk about delaying gratification. They have this bottle of really nice wine or champagne and they just never open it because it's too nice. They don't want to enjoy it. We'll enjoy that later at a better time, more special time. Eventually they just give in and, and drink whatever they want. This is my champagne. This packaged meal of veggie pad thai. I'm always bringing it on trips, and I'm like, no, no, I gotta save it, gotta save it. I bring it primarily for longer trips to just add some variety. I can't make veggie pad thai out here, or it'd be hard anyway. So, today is the end of the delay of gratification. Tastes like the present. Need some sriracha though. I put that on everything. This is great though. I've had it before once. on the water before six again. Woke up at like four, just couldn't sleep. So I'm out here, conditions are pretty good. Waves pounded the shore all night, despite the, the wind seemed to die. And now it's still settling down, but pretty good. What are ya? A lake trout, cool. Oh, and it's got a sea lamprey on it. Oh. Come in, let me get that off you. Oh, brutal. Okay, he's in the net. Check this out. 
sea lampreys came in invasively. They latch themselves on to fish and just bleed them out basically. No way! The lamprey detached on its own. Whoa! The lamprey is swimming around in there now, trying to escape himself. Wet my hands for the trout. Nice laker, thank you. Not a bad scar on him from the lamprey, so it probably hasn't been on for that long. And look at this nasty little guy. The bottom of their mouths is really gross. I don't know. Might be hard to get them to turn upside down, but it's like a suction cup full of teeth. And honestly, I don't know if this is an invasive lamprey or native. So I'm not sure what to do with it. Look on my phone, see if I have any offline resources for ide identifying it. Nasty. It actually, ugh, I'm gonna pick it up. Oh, it's so gross. Ew. I don't want to let his mouth touch my hand, <laughs> to be honest. It is so slippery. I don't think... I really don't think it's a sea lamprey. Oh, it's the grossest thing ever. I can't pick it up, it's too... There, it uh, works with the rubber netting. Look at its mouth. Imagine having that latched onto you. Anyway, I, I did have some ID, and I don't think it is a sea lamprey. I'm pre pretty sure it's not. So I'm going to do what I'm going to do, either dispatch or release. What would you do? I'm not going to record it because there's no pleasing anybody. So I had taken a photo of, of uh, a fish ID book, and yeah, there are chestnut lamprey, silver, northern brook, American brook, and sea lampreys but I'm pretty sure that was a silver lamprey. Not a sea lamprey. Beautiful here in Armour Harbour. Very tranquil. Very interesting place behind me. It's a nation called Narivia. Some guys, I guess over a few beers, decided to occupy that spot. I don't know if it's like a squatter situation, if they somehow acquired it, but anyway, they declared themselves a nation and they have their own anthem and flag. <laughs> Apparently it makes for a pretty funny Google search. I gotta check that out. gentle rollers today. Yesterday it was like chop, 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 chop. Like the canoeing equivalent to driving over a really rough, bumpy road. Today is just like, like that. Heading into the bay where I plan to camp tonight. Do a hike this afternoon. But the wicked headwind's just kicking up here. Haven't been able to find the trailhead yet, but before I do anything, I need lunch. And yay! Souvenirs! Aluminum foil, my favorite souvenir. Found the trailhead thanks to this little beat up flag. Hike to Mount St. Ignis. St. Ignis Island is the largest island in the NMCA region and also contains one of the highest points of land in Ontario. This peak, Mount St. Ignis, is accessed by a little-known yet world-class hiking trail gaining 1,265 feet in elevation over its 5-kilometer length. The hike takes at least 6 hours return and is quite challenging. Here comes the rain. Beautiful hike. I was really excited for this. It's quite an adventure. Beautiful cedars. Growing so straight like spruce. I just did a big climb 
up what I thought was the trail. I'm pretty sure I lost it. I haven't seen a flag or a sawn piece of wood in a while. Must have been a game trail. Probably wasted half an hour, but got back to the trail and right at the right time. Check this out. Oh wow. Trail is no joke. Oh. You gotta climb up this part, right up the side of the waterfall. Oh. This is a tough one. Beautiful though. Spectacular. Ah. <laughs> wow. Oh. What you can see from down there isn't even the whole falls. Oh, I was wondering where the trail goes. Here it is. Seen lots of moose droppings on the trail. Just hoping I might see one at this pond. some moose bones out here. Ninety percent of the way there. Still almost 200 feet of elevation gain left. But I'm getting close. Starting to get my first views. There are some beautiful inland lakes on this island. That one looks stunning. Hey! Oh. the summit just when you think you got there before turns out I checked on my topo it's not it wow that's phenomenal looks like it's raining over there <laughs> oh I might be soaked pretty soon but I wouldn't hate it Finding those. Yeah, here comes that rain. <laughs> what a hike. My hat is off to whoever scouted, cleared, and has maintained this trail. Like it is, it's a beast. It's got to be the toughest trail I've ever done. Not to mention we're in the back half of June and the bugs are pretty thick. Came over to the west side of the peak. It's really, I just wanted to look back on where I'd been. Isn't it ironic? Isn't it ironic? It's like rain on 
your Mount St. Ignace day! When it rains, it rains, you know? And it's the beautiful thing. I have virtually no time constraints now. I quit my job. I'm camping as much as I want. And before, if I was taking my vacation time, yeah, I'd be pretty bummed. But now it's just like another part of the journey. Isn't it ironic? Hey, and look at that. Just cleared up a little so I could see the paps. See everywhere I've been. That lake down there is King Lake. It's an interior lake on this island. I have no idea if there's a trail in. I have to imagine someone has put one in if they put one up to this bloody mountain. Getting real gusts of wind now. It's just so raw up here. I'm not in a hurry to leave actually, unless it gets really nasty. What a hard existence. Every tree, the biggest tree is small. And I love this one in particular. It just stands out so beautifully. This huge water body going right there. That's the Nipigon Strait. That leads into Nipigon Bay. Huge part of Lake Superior. And then uh, that's Floor Island, where I passed a couple days ago. You see the channel goes all the way there, and then there's this big island in the distance splitting it. That's where I was. So hoping it might pass, but it just seems to be picking up. <clears throat> so I'm gonna get down, back down. Totally worth it. Very happy I did this. I needed it too. My legs needed a stretch. They've been sitting in the canoe. No port portages. Has a downside, and it's like your legs are just all cramped up. My only concern now is the descent on all these slippery wet rocks, but I'm sure I'll get there. Just cleared up a little to the west. There are a bunch of the islands that I just came through. And many more in there and beyond. On a map it all looks pretty easy. I'll just skip over to that island and this island. It's a big lake. Next up, across the Moffat Strait over to Simpson Island. Six thirty. No one touched my stuff. That's good. Got to find camp. Hey, hey, just got the canoe loaded up and a rainbow materialized. It looks so close there. I could almost touch it. Beauty. Oh, I see a double. There's a double coming on. You know what that means. It's gonna cross the Moffat Strait just over there, other side of this island, if the wind gave me a chance, but it's still up and I'm out of gas. I've had one meal and I've been going since 4 a.m., so, you know, 15 hours. So, I'm gonna stop here. There's a nice cobble beach, really nicely sheltered from the wind and waves by this little spit, and uh, get a tarp up. But it can still rain, it's on and off, and get a good meal in. It's 
excited for that. Fire feels nice tonight. It's pretty chill, soaked, and that wind was is pretty chilly actually. It's a pretty neat little cave right in there. If I were a better YouTuber, I would sleep in there. But that sounds just awful. Did you sleep in there? It's got a good overhang. Protection from wind and driving rain. But it's very uneven. It'd be terrible. I'm just gonna fake it for the thumbnail. And extract still. Done. Just finished dinner. You can see rain coming across the lake. Ran over here. I'm scrambling to get the tarp up and then I can take all the time in the world to set up my hammock. Oh, yeah, I'm just hearing it start. Feels like you cheated death when you just get ahead of the rain like this. It's wonderful. Another early rise. Let myself sleep in till 5.30 though. Crossing the Moffat Strait, so. I'm gonna get it while it's calm. Alright, conditions look pretty good. Some gentle rollers crashing into these rocks here. Come across to Simpson Island. Another big one. I'm getting into the last couple days of this trip. I think I'll finish it in nine days, and I thought I'd be 10 to 12, but I wasn't, I was never windbound for a full day. I made pretty good progress every day. So I'm ahead of schedule, which is kind of sad, you know, to end early, but better to end on a high note than to dra drag it out and just fizzle out. Very exposed paddling here on the south shore of Simpson Island. Rugged and beautiful though. And conditions seem pretty good. I've got a three kilometer crossing after Simpson Island and I'm going to dip my toe in the water, go around this point and see what, see what it's like. I think this will be my chance to do it. A bear up there on the hill looking down at me. Hey buddy. <laughs> It's too wavy. Getting blown away. So cool. What an awesome vantage point to see one Just browsing on top of a cliff. It's looking good. Three kilometers shouldn't feel like too much if these conditions hold on. Halfway there. After 
2 p.m. I'm just having my first real meal of the day, and I've got my very own picnic table. It's a nice one too, reasonably new. Usually campsite picnic tables are pretty dilapidated, like that one over there. Glad I pushed through this morning while it was calm. The wind's up now, white capping out in that crossing. Perfect evening for the last night here. I'm just soaking it up, looking like it'll be a good sunset. It's almost nine o'clock and the sun doesn't go down till 10, so I still got some time, but it's been a phenomenal trip just looking back on it. As usual, it hasn't been what I expected at all. I thought I'd be seeing moose, I'd have constant fishing, and I'd have really challenging weather. And really none of those things happened. The fishing was decent, perfectly decent. No moose, but bear today, a porcupine, which is way rarer for me than a moose. I never see porcupines. It was the second or third porcupine I've ever seen, so that was fantastic. And then some great interactions with some of the more uh, staple animals and birds. We've got the sandhill cranes and amazing interactions with beavers, actually. Beavers I saw at Dawson's Creek, that was, that was amazing. I've never really seen beavers that well. And uh, that, the one beaver, there was the baby crying, and then the big one, it had shoulders on it. I was actually a little worried about it coming over. It was, looked like an absolute tank. And then the weather, I didn't lose a single day to conditions. I maybe called it early a couple of times, but still made progress every day, and that's why I'm ahead of schedule. I'll finish in nine days. It's, it doesn't matter if you finish in nine, 10, 11, 12 days. Uh, it's about embracing whatever conditions you get on Superior and if you get good conditions you keep going so there's no need to linger and drag it out it was perfect and I really want to say a thank you to Zach and Daryl who published the guidebook for this route for this area actually there are countless routes you could do I could do this route 10 more times and do it totally differently it's just amazing with all the islands and bays there's so much to see. I left a lot on the table, but I, I do plan to come back with Erin someday because she would love this. But uh, these guys are real stewards of this area. Great conservationists. They know this area so well, and that really enhanced my trip. So thank you guys very much. Cheers. Thanks for joining me. And cheers to Lake Superior, my favorite lake on earth. this fantastic book and Edward Abbey he passed in 1989 a year and a half after I was born it makes you wonder what you might be able to leave behind for a place that you love Pancake mix with some cinnamon. Mmm. Love cinnamon. Make them nice and small, easier to flip. You want to have these all trip? There hasn't been time in the morning. It's nice. Slow morning today. Slept in till 6.30. I'm always ashamed of my bed head. How was it today? Is it bad? That was a fantastic final night and I'm looking forward to this final day. Sun's shining. What do we got? Laker. Oh, who's 
in the net. <laughs> it's pretty small. I should have just let him pop off. Thank you. That's the Battle Island Lighthouse. It's about 150 years old. I'd like to get out and check it out, but I'm a bit worried about a wind and, and chop kicking up. I gotta get back to my rendezvous point with Aaron. Last crossing of the trip. The rain's just starting to come on. We'll be in the car before long. How are you? We got hot. I don't know. It feels like maybe a brookie. It's really, uh, it's crazy. Yeah, probably a brookie. Oh, yeah, you got gold gold gold. Sorry? You got gold gold yeah. You were at the Diablo Lake. Diablo Lake? Diablo, yeah. I just watched your video. Oh yeah? <laughs> right on. Nice to meet you. Yeah, likewise. How'd you find that? Oh, this is a nice spec. Is it? Yeah. Oh, Sorry, I might be ruining your book. No, you're not. You're adding to it. You're going to be in it. <laughs> nice spec. Thanks, buddy. Probably not legal, though. Not quite. No. <laughs> no. It's hard to get them legal. No, oh. they're all that size. What a crazy standard, eh? Yeah. Over a half meter spec. That's a big troll. That's, that's a like, big spec. Well, that's like five soft pounds. Like, yeah, that's a big troll. <laughs> I, so I just. another video or what? Yeah, I'm, uh, this is the end of my trip, actually. I'm finishing up in Rossport. I've been out nine days. Oh, really? Started from Silver Islet. No way. Yeah, it's been a great trip. That's, Great. A, that's a good paddle. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> it is a good paddle. That is awesome. Pretty good weather. Yeah. How's your day going? You getting anything? No, oh, we just, we literally just walked. Yeah, are you from Rockford? <laughs> Man, <laughs> that was too funny. Run into some folks. Right as I'm getting close to the end of the trip with a fish on. And it turned out to be the nicest fish of the trip and one of the biggest specs of my life. Hopefully I got a decent shot of it. I didn't have this camera set up, so I just reached back for the GoPro. Now another fish on. Just parting gifts from Superior. That one distinctly felt like a brookie. It's fighting like crazy. This one, probably more likely a laker. Yeah, it looks like it. out. Nice little laker. Thanks buddy. Just pulling into Rossport. Aaron will be here any minute. Here's my ride. World class shuttling services from Aaron Outfitters as always. A fresh delivery of chips, a couple brews, and a, a Perrier. I had paddled Superior a number of times in the last few years, but this trip from the Sleeping Giant really showed me the magic of this lake. At home, I go back to YouTube. And the videos for the previous trips were performing pretty slowly, which was not very promising for being able to maintain this lifestyle long term. The engine on Aaron's truck had also blown recently, somehow water had gotten in it, and replacing it sent us back significantly. But there was no reason to panic yet, and I had plenty of time to make it work. I was still riding the high of my new lifestyle especially thinking back to the city life I had escaped. Five years earlier, I had quit my second marketing job and spent four blissful months camping with my grandpa's old minivan and a new canoe. But as August wound down, it was time to go back to school and begin resetting my career. It was a truly odd feeling to be buying school supplies again. The college was located in a region known as the Corthas in the town of Lindsay. It was about two hours outside of Toronto amongst cottage country and lakes, which was a breath of fresh air. Originally, I was enrolled in a two-year environmental technician diploma, and most of the students would be fresh out of high school. I moved into my room in a five-bedroom shared house, which happened to be occupied by students in the college's GIS program. GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems, which is basically modern-day mapmaking and geographic data management. I thought cartography was a thing of the past, and had no idea people still made maps for a living. My roomies showed me the work they were doing and said it was a good industry for getting work in natural resources. 
The GIS program was also only 10 months instead of two years, and it was a postgrad certificate, meaning that the students would be in their early 20s, and some my age or older. Not to mention my savings would only have to last half as long as planned if I did the GIS program. I quickly applied to switch and got it done before the term began, and I look back with such gratitude that I happened to move into that house of GIS students. However, the program was surprisingly intense. It was a two-year program packed into three terms, and most students there already had experience with GIS software, whereas I had none. During the first term, we got an assignment to design any map we wanted, and of course I chose to make a backcountry map. I made one for a route I had paddled that summer, and I was loving the idea of being able to make maps for my trips. I later expanded on this project to make a paddler's map for the surrounding region, and I've made more maps since for some routes that needed one. The curriculum wasn't all as exciting as this, but I was loving the GIS world despite the program's heavy workload. Free time was limited, but like any student, sometimes I just had to procrastinate. One night while I was supposed to be hammering out an assignment, I got carried away with a little passion project. I got to thinking about the journal I'd kept during the previous summer of camping, and the idea for a blog struck me. I stayed up late into the night, typing up the entire journal and drafting blog posts with pictures from my trips. I titled the blog Backcountry Angling Ontario. Without anything driving traffic to the blog, the views were so low that it was exciting just to see a single page view come in now and then. Still, the idea of having a platform to share my passion excited me. I posted my trip photos on Facebook too, but my friends and family weren't big campers, and what I really wanted was to share my trips with a community of people who had passion for backcountry adventure. As spring arrived, I took a six-day trip during a break between the second and third terms, and on a whim, I decided to film it on a point-and-shoot camera. It is Earth Day, April 22nd, 2017. It's the first camping trip of the season, which makes us the happiest time of year. Back then, in 2017, the camping genre on YouTube was nothing like it is today. Of the hundreds of people who are passionate about sharing their canoe trips now, there seemed to be just a handful back then. I loved watching guys like Kevin Callan, Joe Robinette, and Brad Jennings go camping on their YouTube channels, so I figured I'd give filming a try. My production quality was atrocious, especially the audio on my little camera. The editing was even worse as a beginner using Windows Movie Maker, but I posted it on YouTube under the same name as the blog, Backcountry Angling Ontario. It barely got any views, maybe 20 or 30 over a few weeks if I was lucky, but that didn't really matter. As a soloist, I found it fun to be able to share the experience with others, and the videos were reaching a handful of local paddlers and anglers. At that point, I never even considered the idea of making a living off of YouTube. I was just sharing my passion, and I thought little of it. After 10 busy months in school, I graduated and continued job hunting again. Maybe it was the fact that I had a marketing background and was applying for natural resource roles, but again the transition proved difficult, and I wasn't getting any interviews. Because school took half as long as planned, I still had some money in the bank, so again I took the chance to camp between applying for jobs. I'd recorded a couple more short trips that spring on the point-and-shoot camera, and I was really enjoying the filming and editing process. I carefully invested $900 into a better camera and microphone, and unlike the previous summer of camping, this time I'd film it all. I ended up spending 95 days on trips that season. I pumped out rough vlogs, and never so slowly, the channel grew. It took me almost six months to hit 100 subs, and I'd published almost 100 videos over that period, though they were a shorter format with each day of the trip being its own video. You know you're starting to let go of uh, the constraints of time when you start having naps. Couldn't get any better right now. I just feel so at peace, so at home. This is so vindicating when nature cooperates, when weather cooperates. Nature needs our respect, but weather, <laughs> weather just demands our respect.
This is the type of day that makes you feel really lucky just to be alive. The world's messed up, especially environmentally, but when you're out here uh, connecting with nature, you can't help but feel like you want to fight for it, do anything to protect it. If you are someone who cares about nature or you enjoy nature, you have a huge opportunity to help shape the future. Nature is too precious to throw away. The filming and audio had improved a bit, but they were still pretty rough, and the editing was just plain awful. Between trips, I kept applying to jobs and hoping to come back from each trip to good news. Over six months had passed, and I still had nothing, but I refused to go back to marketing as long as I still had some savings left. I kept my expenses low and moved from Lindsay to a basement in a smaller town called Omimi, hometown of Neil Young. I tried drumming up some freelance GIS work, but couldn't get any real traction since I had no experience in the industry, and I only made a few hundred dollars from those efforts. I was getting desperate for someone to give me a chance, and the lower my savings got, the more my anxiety grew. To make matters worse, earlier in the year my grandpa's van needed some repairs, and I just couldn't justify sinking thousands of dollars into a 20-year-old car. So I got another car and financed it over seven years to minimize the immediate cost. Finally, as Christmas approached, my buddy Mike, who I met at the college, threw me a lifeline. He connected me with a brief contract, just three months, but that bought me time. What really made it a Christmas miracle was the fact that it was with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in Peterborough, Ontario. After a year and a half living on the cheap and using my savings, getting a paycheck again was an incredible relief, and the fact that it was from the MNRF was a dream come true for the city boy. But it was only for three months, so I had to stay on my toes and keep looking for opportunities. Though as soon as I had that job on my resume, the interviews started to roll in. Sometimes you just need someone to let you get your foot in the door. One of my first interviews was with a forestry company a thousand kilometers away on the north shore of Lake Superior. The natural scenery there was stunning, and the quiet little town of Marathon was a perfect launch pad for backcountry tripping. I got offered a permanent role there and took a job that changed my life. I'll finish this backstory in the next chapter, but let's get back to some tripping. The next trip was a shorter one, just a couple of nights, but a really good one. I was headed for a stunning trout lake where I'd been once before, but didn't have time to enjoy it. It was a truly fine piece of water, and it stayed on my mind since I first saw it. Oh yeah! Here it comes. A fitting start for this trip. Oh. A couple of years ago, Aaron and I finished our most brutal trip together. We were wading through the ice, creek whacking, like it was just an awful, brutal trip. Terrible weather. Ended with us getting drenched here on this lake and it was a very memorable trip, but we didn't really get to enjoy a lot of it. So I'm here retracing the end of it, starting from the opposite direction, not doing the entire loop, but just enough to enjoy this end, which we I thought was gorgeous, but we had to rush through. We were just spent, we were done, we were out of time. Hopefully this time I can enjoy it. On to the second portage. Nice, clear one. This lake here, it's a stunner. Big part of the reason why I came back here. That didn't take long. There we go. Oh, I love barbless hooks. You see that just pop out? His hands good and wet. Protect the fish. You're going home, buddy. Second, please. Pretty good start. Not bad at all. Sorry. What are you? What are you? Hook popped out, but he landed in the net. Oh, a tiny little laker. It's one of the smallest lake trout I've ever caught. 
Oh man, look at that little laker. Tiny. Thanks, buddy. This is unbelievable. Another laker. I'm gonna let him pop off here. Seen one laker. You've seen two lakers. This guy just gets to, to go. Less time they're out of the water, the better if you're releasing. This lake is incredible. It's so nice to be able to enjoy it this time. And I could stop here and camp where Aaron and I camped, have a lovely time, fish for lake trout. It's right across for some, some cliffs, so it's really a nice sight. Or I could carry on and do some grueling bushwhack, probably, into some small lakes that I suspect could have rookies. The, the choice should be easy, but I, I pretty much know I'm going to go exploring those bushwhack lakes. There's an amazing campsite here on a point. Of course, light. And uh, it's ruined. What do you make of this? Like a full-on tempo tent shelter. Dilapidated porta potty Lovely. Just charming. Stuff like that is why I go bushwhacking into these little lakes that just no one goes to because they're pristine. This is an incredible spot with a really gross, gross blemish. Back to the good stuff. This lake is just otherwise incredible. And if you can make it out, there's a little rock, exposed rock there. That is where we camped last year. Another laker, a decent one. Good size and quite dark. Thanks, buddy. Oh, jeez. I'm starting to scout from here and I'm just gonna walk. I'm not clearing anything yet. It would just be madness. Before scouting, it's about three quarters of a kilometer, or, I don't know, half a mile. So first time, this is just a feasibility study. Whoa. And we'll see if this is, if there's any hope of this. It's not looking good. Ooh. Black flies, <coughs> mosquitoes, and thick bush. Unless I pick up a trail, this ain't happening. But plan B is pretty good. Beautiful going along this creek though. Yeah, this would be a really sucky bushwhack. Well, good news is that I've made it to the first pond. Bad news, there's no chance that I'm taking the gear and canoe in here. That is way, way too much of a grind for a small pond. It's, there are subsequent ponds and small lakes that I'm hoping to get to, but just this is, is too tough, so. That's all right, it was a lovely walk in the woods. I'm gonna walk back to the last lake, and if I run into a trail, that's the only thing that would save this mission, but the thought of just enjoying the last lake and eating lake trout, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, this little pond is not worth coming to. Oh, would you look at that? Glass. That's crazy. Who and why? It's gotta be snowmobilers, which would require a snowmobile trail. There is a canoe. There is a canoe right there. It's, it looks very old. Let me check that out. Maybe there is, oh, and now it could be a trail. You gotta be kidding me. Oh man, <laughs> this could mean a lot of work.
looks like a trail. Can't believe that. So that must link up with the portage to the next lake. I took the most direct route, but clearly there's another way. <laughs> this is one of those little stubby like sports pals or if there were paddles, I don't think there are, I would paddle across the lake and see what's up, look for another trail. But I still don't think this is worth it. If anything, I'll have to come back another time now knowing this trail exists because too much X factor beyond. Oh man, this canoe is in rough shape. Okay, I saw it. That's enough. The trail looked a lot better at the landing there. It's actually quite rough, so all the more reason to say no. So now I need to get back to that campsite, which might be impossible in this wind. Just behind the last point, as soon as I turn this corner, it's going to get really nasty. You see that? Does it make you want to litter? Boggles the mind, doesn't it? Water in the food barrel in the shade there. Tons of sticks for cooking. And a terrific hammock setup back here with a million dollar view. Okay, took absolutely no time. There's camp. Thirty seconds later. This is insane. Pulled up on this gravel beach at the end of the lake, south end. Some moose tracks. That would just be an incredible scene here. A moose standing here, looking out at the lake. The size of this guy. 
so cute. I'm curious, as someone watching this video, would you have rather seen me slog into those small lakes where I potentially get no fish, just the hope of brook trout, or have an enjoyable trip on this very scenic lake, catching and soon eating lake trout? Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. Found a good cut log, which would make a nice cutting board. I just took the head and pulled it back, and then most of the innards come out with it. And just have to scrape all this stuff out. Here's okay. Flip this log over. Got a table now. Oh, it smells good. I just got a whip. Mmm. Oh, wow. That's all that's left. Plus the rib bones. Already burnt. Mmm. Right now I'm feeling pretty good about the decision to stay on this lake. I could be bushwhacking through thick bush and black flies, all for potentially no fish. So it was the right call on this one. Otter or a mink? I can't tell yet, it's pretty far away. I'm zoomed in. Curious about me. Wind is up. Perfect conditions for reading, though. The upside of the wind is no bugs. And I hope it's blowing in a big storm. That would be fun tonight. good storm last night. Packed up under the tarp because it still looks pretty gray. Got some firewood there under the tarp. I don't know if the mic will be able to pick this up, but somewhere over there Something's clopping along. It sounds like a moose walking on the edge of the water. I don't see it though. Hear that? There it is. Awesome. That it? That was an awesome way to start the day. Ricola!
still biting. There you go. Thanks, buddy. Huh. Okay, there you go. It's just a lake trout paradise. Deep, cold, rocky lake. It's actually over 300 feet deep. Okay, back to the access lake. Man, it's a scorcher today. It's only 10.30. It's already really hot and muggy and buggy. It's hard to believe that Aaron and I ended our brutal trip here when it's been such an ideal little trip for me. And I have a feeling I'll be back for those potential brook trout lakes someday. Hopefully with Aaron. It'd be better with uh, a little reinforcement. It wouldn't be long before Wanderlust called me back to explore those potential brook trout lakes. I went home for the usual routine before and after each trip. A much needed shower, dry out gear, wash clothes, edit footage, respond to messages, charge batteries, resupply a food barrel, swap out maps, and so on. I'll talk more about the behind the scenes work on the channel in the next episodes, but let's go back and finish off the story of how the dream of full time camping became reality. I left off where I'd taken a new job on the north shore of Lake Superior in the spring of 2018. The channel, now a year old, still only had 400 subs and was not even eligible for monetization on YouTube. It was still purely a hobby and I had no illusions of doing it full time. But restarting my life in the north had changed everything. I had a steady job making maps which I enjoyed and home ownership was actually a possibility here compared to the insane prices in Toronto. There was also boreal wilderness at my doorstep for weekend getaways. In the city, a weekend of camping took hours of driving and usually a frustrating battle with traffic. The proximity of wilderness in the north allowed me to continue posting trips regularly while I worked. The move also led me to the greatest reward of all. After half a year, I found a northern girl on Tinder named Erin. She lived four hours away in the town of Geraldton, and I had told myself I wouldn't consider long distance. So had she. We also lived far enough away from each other that we were outside the maximum radius on Tinder, so it's still a miracle that we ever matched. We figured we must have driven past each other on the highway one day and gotten into each other's suggested profiles. I was inclined to swipe right on her profile seeing that she was soloing a canoe in one of her photos. We quickly planned a date for a hike at Ruby Lake Provincial Park, halfway between us near the town of Nipigon. First we met at Tim's so she could screen me and send my license plate to her cop friend before going on a hike with a stranger. When I first walked in, the look on her face told me she was not interested. It was the kind of look you might get if you catfished someone. I guess I didn't know how to read her, and thankfully I was wrong. She was just a little nervous, as all of us are on a first date. She decided I was safe, and we carried on to the hike. As we made our way to the lookout, I learned that Erin was born and raised in nearby Thunder Bay by adventurous parents who took her camping on rivers like the Kopka and Missinabi at a young age. She loved to be outside, and wasn't afraid of mud, mosquitoes, or miserable weather. She played sports, built her own house, had all sorts of talents like stained glass and woodworking, and was preparing to start her master's in counseling psychology. I was head over heels in no time. We upped the ante for our second date and went winter camping in the middle of nowhere. I told her I normally recorded my trips for YouTube to feel her out on the idea. She had no problem with it, so I captured a bit of footage while trying not to make it too weird. What a treasured memory that footage is now. How many can say that they have their second date on video? After eight months, we were tired of long distance, so in the summer of 2019, I bought us a house and she moved in and took a new job in Marathon. Housing markets in small mining towns run hot and cold, and it happened to be a great time to buy. The three-bedroom house with a finished basement was ridiculously cheap. What I paid for the house wouldn't have even covered a down payment in Toronto. It wasn't a fancy house, but we're not fancy people. Our mortgage was a puny $250 a month, and this would become a significant factor in making YouTubing full-time financially viable. Shortly before buying the house, the channel had become eligible for monetization on YouTube. To monetize, you need to get 1,000 subs with 4,000 watch hours over the prior 12 months. At first I was reluctant to do this, but decided to try it. The trips continued, and in the first 6 months after monetizing the channel, I made $800. And that was while putting full-time hours into it on top of my full-time job. But I was doing it out of passion, so anything I was making from the channel was just gravy. That income came exclusively from ads playing on our videos, and YouTube handled all of the business side. Over the following six months, the channel got a bit more traction and I made over $5,000, bringing the total during my first full year of monetization to about $6,000. Not enough to pay the bills, even with our modest expenses, but the seed of an idea started to take root. 
In the second full year of monetization, I made $21,000 from the channel, and it now had 40,000 people subscribed to it after its first four years. If I did the math, I was making less than minimum wage for the 40 plus hours a week I put into the channel, and it was hardly meteoric growth. In the scope of social media, the channel was still tiny. Meanwhile, at my real job, the hours of clicking away at a desk were resulting in some health problems, and after almost three years there, the itch of wanderlust was nagging at me. I mentioned that there are over 250,000 lakes in Ontario alone, and many of them are seldom seen. Every time I looked at a map, they all seemed to beg me to explore them. With my savings, low expenses at home, and a growing income from the channel, I began to discuss the possibility of taking a risk on YouTube with Erin. She supported me without hesitation, and I was all the more in love with her for it. Erin could support us with her job if need be, but I wouldn't let her shoulder that load while I played out in the bush. And not out of macho man pride, just out of mutual respect. Through my career transitions, I always supported myself, and I generally struggled to accept gifts, help, or favors. Self-reliance is freedom, and I cherish it. But with Erin, I realized that having a partner you can depend on means stability. She made taking a risk with YouTube that much more possible. Through the early months of the year, we continued to discuss the plan until I finally committed to it. I resigned from my job in March, giving two months notice. We also decided to rename the channel, which was still called Backcountry Angling Ontario. As a marketing grad, I should have known the name was too niche, too long, and too hard to remember. But at least it attracted that initial audience. We mulled over countless names for a few months, with nothing feeling quite right. Driving home from Thunder Bay one wintry day, the name Lost Lakes popped into my head. It was no stroke of brilliance, but it felt right for us, and who doesn't like some alliteration? So Lost Lakes was born, and that spring the dream began. I was officially a full-time camper, and that brings us up to speed with the trips you just saw. After a slow start for the first videos of the paddling season, the trip of Superior's North Shore was taking off like nothing we'd experienced on YouTube so far. But these surges come and go, and to keep income coming in, the trips and videos had to keep coming too. Getting paid by YouTube to make camping videos was sweet, but it wasn't really about the money, it was still about tripping. I got to this point by following my passion, not chasing money, and that wasn't about to change. For the time being, the dream was alive and well, and the season still had some incredible trips ahead, as spring blossomed into summer.